Hi, this is Andy Shore with your Pulmonary and Critical Care Literature Update for the month of April. I'd like to talk about two articles today that were recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. The first dealt with blood sugar control in critically ill patients. The second dealt with the treatment of asthma as it relates to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Nice Sugar, the glucose control study, was published towards the end of March in the New England Journal. This trial focused on blood glucose management in critically ill subjects, which is a major focus of quality improvement and actually an area where we have some published guidelines that I think clearly need to be revised. What this study did was really try to get to the crux of the issue we've all been grappling with, which is how low do you go and what does blood sugar actually mean for control of outcomes in the ICU. We have a recent meta-analysis that suggests that blood sugar control does not seem to be associated with improved outcomes and there may be some suggestion of harm. The, college, the authors in this trial that were enrolling patients across the globe in this study that was led by both the Australia New Zealand Critical Care Societies and the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group hope to definitively answer this question. In this trial of 6,000 patients, they randomized critically ill subjects to one of two treatment paradigms for blood sugar. In the control arm or the liberal arm for blood sugar control, the target blood sugar was 180 which is in fact lower than we used to accept it historically, but that was considered the control arm. In the intervention arm, tight blood glucose control, the targeted range was 81 to 108. So a very tight level, a lot of patients requiring a lot of insulin. Again, they enrolled 6,000 patients. They went to 90-day all-cause mortality as an endpoint, and what they found was that tight blood sugar control in that range of 81 to 108 was associated with an increased risk of death. The hazard ratio for death was about 14% excess mortality risk. Crude unadjusted mortality rate in the tight control intervention arm was about 28% versus about 25% in the control arm. Overall, the study has a lot of face validity because they seem to enroll patients we all seem to treat. The median Apache 2 score was about 22. A good number of these patients were surgical, so this was not just a medical population. And it's important to note that unlike a lot of the studies done by Vandenberg and colleagues initially that started the focus on blood sugar control, the vast majority of subjects in these trials were receiving enteral and not parenteral nutrition. So again, it reflects much more like what we do in the U.S. Across all subgroups that they evaluated, they never saw a potential benefit with tighter blood sugar control. There was always this consistent signal of harm, and there were certainly more episodes of hypoglycemia in this population overall. At this point, I think the study forces us to reevaluate how we're going to do tight blood sugar control and even raises the first order question, which is why should we do it if there's a suggestion of harm? We're all on these bandwagons when we all go to blood glucose control school now and again to be re-educated about how important this is, but I think we have to step back and say, for as much as we think we do know, there's often a lot we don't know. In addition, realize though that the control arm blood sugar range of 180 not only is historically lower from where we've accepted it in the past, in actuality, in this study, that blood sugar in those patients wasn't usually 180, it was more like 140. So perhaps 140 seems to be an acceptable range in a critically ill patient, not 180, not 220, but certainly pushing it, at least with the current tools we have to achieve blood sugar control and to monitor blood sugar control, more importantly, getting it to the 108 range or below is associated with harm. So given that, I think we need to go back to our administrators, we need to go back to our payors and say to them, Ladies and gentlemen, you need to reevaluate the literature because we've learned a lot of new things. So there's been a lot that's changed in the asthma and the critical care literature in the last month. Again, these two studies were recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they bear directly on our practice in pulmonary and critical care. Thank you very much. This is Andrew Shore from the Washington Hospital Center. Have a good week.